from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Hello, and welcome to another edifying episode of The Sculptor's Funeral. I am your host, Jason Arkels, a sculptor and teacher living in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. And today, we're going to be delving into one of the most colorful figures in the history of sculpture. Benvenuto Cellini is the anti-hero of the High Renaissance. He's one of the most despicable and at the same time most colorful figures in the history of art. If you know just a little about Benvenuto Cellini, you know that he was the creator of the Perseus, which stands in the Piazza Signoria here in Florence, sharing a public space with several other masterpieces of the Renaissance, such as Donatello's Judith, Michelangelo's David, and John Bologna's Rape of a Sabine. And those of you who know a little bit more about Benvenuto Cellini know that he wrote the first autobiography of an artist called simply Autobiography. And if you have actually read his book, then you also know that Benvenuto Cellini was an arrogant, spiteful, haughty, paranoid, self-serving, pandering, misanthropic, lying, murdering rapist. Just an awful human being, really. And at the same time, <laughs> there's a definite attraction to him. Reading his autobiography is like watching a train wreck. You just, you just can't look away. It's kind of inexplicable, really, unless you've, unless you've read the book yourself. What I think it is, is that Cellini is just so frank and unapologetic for who he is when he writes about his life. You kind of have to respect him for it. It's from Cellini's own pen that we learn most of the worst qualities of the man. The irony is that he wrote his autobiography to establish his legacy of greatness as a sculptor, much in the way that Michelangelo commissioned Condivi to write Michelangelo's biography. But Cellini's book, more than anything else, paints a picture of a horrible, horrible man. And in doing so, he creates one of the most vivid and lasting portraits of the High Renaissance. Without the autobiography, Cellini would just be a, a one-hit wonder of early mannerism, with his crimes and misdeeds largely forgotten to history. But more on the autobiography later. Let's, let's find out uh, a little bit about his life in general, and his masterpiece, the Perseus, and then a little little about this uh, this thing called mannerism. Now, Cellini was a Florentine goldsmith and a sculptor living during Michelangelo's lifetime, though of a younger generation. He was one of several sculptors of his generation that we now, today, refer to as the mannerists. You see, the, the artistic achievements of Michelangelo and Raphael and Leonardo in the early years of the 1500s uh, those artistic achievements were so astoundingly great that most artists who immediately followed them could not help but work in the shadow of these masters. Many sculptors tried to emulate the style of Michelangelo, and a few consciously reacted against him, but no one could ignore him. The power of his writhing, contorted figures on the, on the, on the Sistine ceiling, as well as the slaves and, and captives trapped within the half-carved blocks of marble that were meant for the tomb of Pope Julius, cast a spell on sculptors in the 16th century. Overmuscled, contorted, twisted, and straining forms dominate both painting and sculpture uh, in Florence and elsewhere for the better part of a century, based on the prototypes established by the divine Michelangelo. Now these were the mannerists. They worked in the manner of Michelangelo. But the ambitious Florentine sculptors of the 16th century were not content with mere emulation. They studied Michelangelo's manner in order to best him, the way that Michelangelo himself had bested the work of Donatello. They had every reason to imagine that the trend of the new young generation producing masterpieces greater than the generation preceding it would continue. I mean, hadn't this been the, the, the case for almost two centuries? Michelangelo was better than Donatello who was better than Andrea Pisano, who was better than Arnolfo di Cambio. It was the way of things, right? The only question remaining was who, who would unseat Michelangelo? Would it be Bartolomeo Amenati, or perhaps Baccio Bandinelli, or Vincenzo Danti, or maybe Benvenuto Cellini? Now, with our 21st century hindsight, we know what that answer was. 
The answer is none of the above. But it was a question which burned brightly in many sculptors' minds in those days, and it spurred the sculptors on to more muscled, more contorted figures, as if somehow more meant better. The Mannerists had ambition, but they had little of the intellect and understanding and depth of soul which led Michelangelo to achieve his own personal greatness. Now, Benvenuto Cellini started his career like many Florentine sculptors before him, that is, as a goldsmith. In fact, it can be argued that rather than being a sculptor, uh, Cellini was a goldsmith who also, from time to time, did some sculpture. In fact, there are only a few of his sculptures which survive to this day, and precious, precious little of his goldsmith's work. The most notable work of Cellini's, after his Perseus, that survives to this day, is a golden salt cellar he made for the King of France. If I'm not mistaken, there are more statues of Cellini than by Cellini here in Florence. His lack of experience in large sculpture makes his colossal Perseus all the more noteworthy of being recognized as a masterpiece of Mannerist sculpture. Cellini was born in the year 1500, a few years after Michelangelo completes his Pietà, and a few years before Michelangelo's David is done. So Benvenuto, he, he grew up in a Florence already dominated by the Renaissance master. From an early age, Benvenuto showed talents in two arenas, goldsmithing and violence. Several years into his apprenticeship, Benvenuto gets into basically a gang fight, and he's banished from Florence for six months. He goes to Siena, and he finds work there, and, and this begins several years of traveling around, producing works in goldsmith shops wherever he goes. He goes to Siena, Bologna, Pisa, back to Florence, and then to Rome. And at some point along the way, he's, uh, he's convicted of sodomizing a boy, and he's forced to pay a fine. And this is the first of uh, several such convictions throughout his life. But nevertheless, in Rome, he produces some nice work for the right people, that is, for bishops and cardinals. And he eventually attracts the attention of the Pope himself, Clement VII. Then something pretty crazy happens. The sack of Rome in 1527. Now, in a nutshell... The Pope, who was at the time allied with France and Florence and Milan and a few other places, this big sort of alliance, they fought and beat the Holy Roman Empire, which was trying to gain some territory in Italy. But the problem was, the Pope used French soldiers to do it, and after it was over, the Pope found that he didn't have enough money to pay all the soldiers he hired. So the soldiers then mutinied, marched on Rome, and pillaged it. And that was the sack of Rome in 1527. Now, this revolt, the sack, was led by the Duke of Bourbon, Charles III. Now, Cellini, like many others who were in Rome, they fought to protect Rome. But apparently, it was Benvenuto Cellini himself who ended up shooting and killing the leader of the revolt, Charles III, Duke of Bourbon. Now, this made Cellini popular with the papacy and with Florence, who, of course, was an ally with the Pope at the time. Now, this event, this killing of Charles III, Duke of Bourbon, this event was to prove crucial to Cellini's fortunes for the rest of his life, really, as it seems like it became his get-out-of-jail-free card. Because basically, from this point on, Cellini was constantly getting into big, big trouble. In 1529, just a few years after the sack of Rome, Benvenuto's brother, Cecchino, who also lived in Rome, he killed a corporal of the Roman watch in a fight, just in a street fight. Now, Cecchino attempted to kill another soldier in the fight, but ended up getting himself killed in the process. So his brother, Benvenuto, enacted a revenge killing on the guy who killed his brother, a man who had merely acted in self-defense. A little later, Benvenuto almost killed another guy, just in an argument in the street, by hitting him on the head with a rock. And soon after that, he actually did kill someone else, a fellow goldsmith he just didn't like. And he killed him in cold blood. But he got away with it all. Apparently, it was only when he was accused and imprisoned for stealing some jewels from the Pope himself that he finally realized he kind of needed to get out of Rome for a while. Powerful friends made that happen for him, and Benvenuto now find, finds himself in France, working for the French king Francis I. Now, in France... Cellini develops his usual pattern of dividing the world into his best friends and his worst enemies, with little room for middle ground. He's a very sort of hot and cold sort of guy. 
and real or imagined, he sees jealousies and intrigues all around him. He, he plots revenge against his detractors while kissing the feet of those in power. He also finds the time to be convicted of sodomizing one of his female models. After five years of this, he returns to Florence to work for Cosimo I, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Now, up to this point, Cellini had done very few statues, uh, very few of which survive intact to this day. Uh, the only large statue we have from him, of course, is the Perseus and Medusa, which was commissioned in 1545 from Cosimo I, and it took Cellini nine years to complete. It was instantly regarded as a masterpiece. However, before it was finished, it caused Cellini a great deal of grief, both on a technical level, it being the most complex large bronze cast in Florence up to that point, but also a lot of grief was caused by his doubters and his detractors, of which there were quite a few. I suppose that isn't so surprising, though, considering Cellini's Perseus is an incredibly ambitious work for someone who normally makes, you know, small things, metals, tableware, salt cellars. And Cellini's biggest detractor was a sculptor named Baccio Bandinelli, a Florentine sculptor typical of his time, i.e. he was a, a worshipper of Michelangelo and an imitator of Michelangelo's style, as much as he could be. I mean, Bandinelli, it has to be said, was one of the worst sculptors of his day. It's Looking at his work, it's sort of amazing how little grace and ability and finesse exists in his sculptures. And equally amazing is how many great commissions he received during his lifetime. Now, his most well-known piece of Baccio Bandinelli, it's uh, the Hercules and Cacus, which stands next to Michelangelo's David in the Piazza Signoria. When it was unveiled in 1534, it met with widespread ridicule. Everybody hated it, and Cellini is probably its most famous detractor. The rivalry between Cellini and Bandinelli was a very, very strong one, a heated one, and the perceived stakes that they were fighting over were very high. They were fighting over who would be the next great Florentine sculptor after Michelangelo. In any event, the Perseus, it won Cellini as much fame as the Hercules awarded Bandinelli with ridicule. Now, we may assume the great success of the Perseus was what kept Cellini out of prison for yet another conviction of sodomy in 1556, this time with his own apprentice boy. His sentence of four years in prison for this crime was turned into four years of just house arrest. So, what do you do when you're sentenced to house arrest for sodomy? Well, you write your autobiography so the world can know how amazing you are, of course. And this is what Cellini did. So, ever following in Michelangelo's footsteps, Cellini records his life in a book only a few years after Michelangelo sees his dictated version of his own life published, written by Ascanio Condivi. Taking his cues from that work, Cellini embellishes his already colorful and eventful life with tall tales and exaggerations, ranging from the time Cellini summons devils at midnight to the Colosseum, angelic visitations and protections, his many noble and just triumphs over the sniveling Baccio Bandinelli, the great love and esteem popes, kings, and dukes all share for Cellini and his immense talents. But at the same time, Cellini, in his book, seems to have no filter. He is unflinching in portraying himself as the arrogant, abusive hothead he actually was. I mean, he almost seems to revel in it. As I mentioned, most of the horrible things we know about Cellini come from Cellini's own hand. But even during his uh, house arrest, and also after, Cellini never stopped producing works of extreme talent and beauty in gold, silver, and precious stones until his death in 1571, when he was buried with great ceremony here in Florence. So that's the life of Cellini in a nutshell. Um, now, usually when I give an, an artist's biography like that, I will backtrack and discuss in more length a single work of that artist. But today, rather than me talking about Cellini's Perseus, we might as well hear it from Cellini himself. So what I've done, and you're going to have to humor me here, what I've done is I've edited and abridged Cellini's autobiography to just the sections concerning the Perseus and also some other parts of his, of his book, which will give you an idea of just how crazy, shameless, violent, and hilarious Benvenuto Cellini actually was. So, without further ado, the Sculptor's Funeral Theater presents...
Cellini in his own words. The Duke of Florence at this time, which was the month of August 1545, had retired to Poggio a Cagliano, ten miles distant from Florence. Thither then I went, to pay him my respects, with the sole object of acting as duty required, because first I was a Florentine, and next because my forefathers had always been adherents to the Medicean party, and I yielded to none of them in affection for this Duke Cosimo. As I have said, then, I rode to Poggio, with the sole object of paying my respects, and with no intention of accepting service under him, as God, who does all things well, did then appoint for me. When I was introduced, the Duke received me very kindly. Then he and the Duchess put questions concerning the works which I had executed for the King of France. I answered willingly and in detail, and after listening to my story, he answered that he had heard as much, and that I spoke the truth. Then he assumed a tone of sympathy, and added, How small a recompense for such great and noble masterpieces! Friend Benvenuto, if you feel inclined to execute something for me too, I am ready to pay you far better than that king of yours had done, for whom your excellent nature prompts you to speak so gratefully. If you are disposed to work for me, I will treat you in a way that will astonish you, provided the fruits of your labors give me satisfaction, of which I have no doubt. I, poor unhappy mortal, burning with desire to show the noble school of Florence that, after leaving her in her youth, I had practiced other branches of the art than she imagined, gave answer to the duke that I would willingly erect for him, in marble or in bronze, a mighty statue on his fine piazza. He replied that, for a first essay, he should like me to produce a Perseus. He had long set his heart on having such a monument, and he begged me to begin a model for the same. I very gladly set myself to the task, and in a few weeks I finished my model, which was about a cubit high, in yellow wax, and very delicately finished in all its details. I had made it with the most thorough study and art. The Duke returned to Florence, but several days passed before I had an opportunity of showing my model. However, one day after dinner, I took it to his wardrobe, where he came to inspect it with the Duchess and a few gentlemen of the court. No sooner had he seen it than he expressed much pleasure and extolled it to the skies, wherefrom I gathered some hope that he might really be a connoisseur of art. <laughs> After having well considered it for some time, always with greater satisfaction, he begins as follows. If you could only execute this little model, Benvenuto, with the same perfection on a large scale, it would be the finest piece in the piazza. I replied, most excellent, my lord, upon the piazza are now standing works by the great Donatello and the incomparable Michelangelo, the two greatest men who ever have lived since the days of the ancients. But since your excellency encourages my model with such praise, I feel the heart to execute it at least thrice as well in bronze. No slight dispute arose upon this declaration the duke protesting that he understood these matters perfectly and, and was quite aware of what could be done. I rejoined that my achievements would resolve his dubitations and debates. I was absolutely sure of being able to perform far more than I had promised for His Excellency, but that he must give me means of carrying out my work, else I could not fulfill my undertaking. In return for this, his Excellency bade me formulate my demands in a petition, detailing all my requirements, and he would see them liberally attended to. Well, being now inflamed with a great desire to begin working, I told His Excellency that I had need of a house, where I could install myself and erect furnaces in order to commence operations in clay and bronze, and also, according to their separate requirements, in gold and silver. I knew that he was well aware how thoroughly I could serve him in those several branches, and I required some dwelling fitted for my business. In order that His Excellency might perceive how earnestly I wished to work for him, I had already chosen a convenient house, in a quarter much to my liking. 
His Excellency committed the execution of these orders to his major domo, who was named Ser Pier Francesco Riccio. This man came from Prato and had been the Duke's pedagogue. I talked then to this donkey and described my requirements, for there was a garden adjoining the house on which I wanted to erect a workshop. He handed the matter over to a paymaster, dry and meager, who bore the name of Latanzio Gorini. And this flimsy little fellow with his tiny spider's hands and small gnat's voice moved about the business at a snail's pace. And yet, in an evil hour, he sent me stones, sand, and lime enough to build perhaps a pigeon house with careful management. <laughs> Well, when I saw how coldly things were going forward, I began to feel dismayed. However, I said to myself, little beginnings have great endings, and I fostered hope in my heart by noticing how many thousand ducats had recently been squandered upon ugly pieces of bad sculpture turned out by that beast of a Baccio Bandinelli. So I rallied my spirits and kept prodding at Latanzio Gorini to make him go a little faster, but it was like shouting to a pack of lame donkeys with a, with a blind dwarf for their driver. Under these difficulties, and by the use of my own money, I had soon marked out the foundations of the workshop and cleared the ground of trees and vines, laboring on, according to my want, with fire and perhaps a trifle of impatience. While the workshop for executing my Perseus was in building, I used to work in a ground floor room. Here, I modeled the statue in plaster, giving it the same dimensions as the bronze was meant to have, and intending to cast it from this mold. But finding that it would take rather long to carry it out in this way, I resolved upon another expedient, especially as now a wretched little studio had been erected, brick on brick so miserably built that the mere recollection of it gives me pain. So then I began the figure of Medusa, and constructed the skeleton in iron. Afterwards, I put on the clay, and when that was modeled, I baked it. I had no assistance, except some little shop boys, among whom was one of a great beauty. He was the son of a prostitute called La Gambetta. I made use of the lad, as a model, for the only books which teach this art are the natural human body. Meanwhile, as I could not do everything alone, I, I looked about for workmen in order to put the business quickly through, but I was unable to find any. There were indeed some in Florence who would willingly have come, but Bandinelli prevented them, and, after keeping me in want of aid a while, he told the Duke that I was trying to entice his workpeople because I was quite incapable of setting up so great a statue myself. I complained to the Duke of the annoyance which this brute gave me, and begged him to allow me some of the laborers from the Opera del Duomo. My request inclined him to lend ear to Bandanello's calumnies, and when I noticed that, I set about to do my utmost by myself, alone. The labor was enormous. I had to strain every muscle night and day. And just then, the husband of my sister sickened and died after a few days' illness. He left my sister, still young, with six girls of all ages on my hands. And this was the first great trial I endured in Florence, to be made the father and guardian of such a distressed family. In my anxiety that nothing should go wrong, I sent for two hand laborers to clear my garden of rubbish. They came from Ponte Vecchio, the one an old man of sixty years, the other a young fellow of eighteen. After employing them about three days, the lad told me the old man would not work, and that I had better send him away, since, besides being idle, he prevented his comrade from working. The little I had to do there could be done by himself, without throwing money away on other people. This youth was called Bernardino Mandinelli of Mugello, and when I saw that he was so inclined to labor, I asked whether he would enter my service, and we agreed upon the spot. He groomed my horse, he gardened, and soon essayed to help me in the workshop, with great success, that by degrees he learned the art quite nicely. I never had a better assistant than he proved. 
Having made up my mind to accomplish the whole affair with this man's aid, I now let the Duke know that Bandanello was lying and that I could get on famously without his work people. Meanwhile, I was advancing with my great statue of Medusa. I had covered the iron skeleton with clay, which I modeled like a, an anatomical subject, and about half an inch thinner than the bronze would be. This I baked well, and then I began to spread on the wax surface in order to complete the figure to my liking. The first piece I cast in bronze was that great bust, the portrait of His Excellency. It gave me much pleasure when it was completed. I was, of course, aware that the admirable sculptor Donatello had cast his bronzes with the clay of Florence, yet it seemed to me that he had met with enormous difficulties in their execution. As I thought this was due to some fault in the earth, I wanted to make these first experiments before I undertook my Perseus. From them I learned that the clay was quite good enough, and with it I cast the bust. Now when I saw that this bust came out sharp and clean, I set at once to construct a little furnace in the workshop erected for me by the Duke, after my own plans and design, in the house which the Duke had given me. No sooner was the furnace ready than I went to work with all diligence upon the casting of Medusa, that is, the woman twisted in a heap beneath the feet of Perseus. It was an extremely difficult task, and I was anxious to observe all the niceties of art which I had learned so as not to lapse into some error. The first cast I took in my furnace succeeded in the superlative degree, and it was so clean that my friends thought I should not need to retouch it. It is true that certain Germans and Frenchmen, who vaunt the possession of marvelous secrets, pretend that they can cast bronzes without retouching them, but this is really nonsense, because the bronze, when it has first been cast, ought to be worked over and beaten with hammers and chisels, according to the manner of the ancients, and also that of the moderns, I mean, such moderns as have known how to work in bronze. The result of this casting greatly pleased His Excellency, who often came to my house to inspect it, encouraging me by the interest he showed to do my best. But the furious envy of Bandanello, however, who kept always whispering in the Duke's ears, had such effect that he made him believe my first successes with a single figure or two proved nothing. I should never be able to put the whole large piece together since I was new to the craft, and His Excellency ought to take good heed he did not throw his money away. These insinuations operated so efficiently on the Duke's illustrious ears that part of my allowance for workmen was withdrawn. I felt compelled to complain pretty sharply to His Excellency, and having gone to wait on him one morning in the Via dei Servi, I spoke as follows. My lord, I do not now receive the monies necessary for my task, which makes me fear that Your Excellency has lost confidence in me. Once more, then, I tell you that I feel quite able to execute this statue three times better than the model, as I have before engaged my word. And when he saw the firmness of my resolution, he turned with some irritation and exclaimed, Benvenuto, if you want to finish the statue, you shall lack for nothing. Then I thanked him, and I said I had no greater desire than to show those envious folk that I had it in me to execute the promised work. When I left His Excellency, I received some slight assistance, but this not being sufficient, I had to put my hand into my own purse in order to push the work forward at something better than a snail's pace. The Duchess kept urging me to do goldsmith's work for her. I frequently replied that everybody, nay, all Italy, knew that I was an excellent goldsmith, but Italy had not yet seen what I could do in sculpture. Among artists, certain enraged sculptors <laughs> laughed at me and called me the new sculptor. <laughs> Now I hope to show them that I am an old sculptor, if God shall grant me the boon of finishing my Perseus for that noble piazza of his most illustrious excellency. I now stayed at home, and rarely went to the palace, laboring with great diligence to complete my statue. I had to pay the workmen out of my own pocket. For the Duke, 
After giving Latanzio Gorini orders to discharge their wages at the end of about 18 months, grew tired and withdrew this subsidy. I asked Latanzio why he did not pay me as usual, and the man replied, gesticulating with those spidery hands of his in his shrill gnat's voice, Well, why do you not finish your work? One thinks you'll never get it done. In a rage, I up and answered, May the plague catch you and all who dare to think I shall not finish it. So I went home with despair at heart, to my unlucky Perseus, not without weeping, when I remembered the prosperity I had abandoned in Paris under the patronage of that marvelous King Francis, where I had abundance of all kinds, and here had everything to want for. Many a time I had it in my soul to cast myself away for lost. One day, on one of these occasions, I mounted a nice nag I had, put a hundred crowns in my purse, and went to Fiesoli to visit a, uh, a natural son of mine, who was at nurse with my gossip, the wife of one of my work people. When I reached the house, I found the boy in good health, and I kissed him, very sad at heart. On taking leave, he would not let me go, but held me in his little hands and a tempest of cries and tears. <laughs> Considering he was only two years old, or, or thereabouts, the child's grief was <laughs> something wonderful. Now, I had resolved, in the heat of my despair, that if I met Bandanello, who, who went every evening to a farm of his above San Domenico, that I would hurl him to destruction. So I disengaged myself from my baby, and I left the boy there sobbing his heart out. And taking the road towards Florence, just when I entered the piazza of San Domenico, <laughs> Bandanello was arriving from the other side. On the instant, I decided upon bloodshed, but when I reached the man and raised my eyes, I saw him unarmed, riding a sorry mule, or rather donkey, and he had with him a boy of ten years old. No sooner did he catch sight of me than he turned the color of a corpse and trembled from head to foot. Perceiving at once how base the business would be, I exclaimed, Fear not, vile coward! I do not condescend to smite you. He looked at me submissively and said nothing. Thereupon I recovered command of my faculties and thanked God that his goodness had withheld me from so great an act of violence. Then, being delivered from that fiendish fury, my spirits arose and I said to myself, If God but grant me to execute my work, I hope by its means to annihilate all my scoundrelly enemies. And thus I shall perform far greater and more glorious revenges than if I had vented my rage upon one single foe. Having this excellent resolve in heart, I reached my home. At the end of three days, news was brought to me that my only son had been smothered by his nurse, which gave me greater grief than I have ever had in my whole life. However, I knelt upon the ground, and, not without tears, returned thanks to God, <laughs> as I was wont, exclaiming, Lord, thou gavest me the child, and thou hast taken him. For all thy dealings, I thank thee with my whole heart. This great sorrow went nigh to depriving me of reason, yet, according to my habit, I made a virtue of necessity and adapted myself to circumstances as well as I was able. It happened one feast day that I went to the palace after dinner, and when I reached the cloakroom, I saw the door of the wardrobe standing open. As I drew nigh it, the duke called me and, after a, a friendly greeting, said, Ah, you are welcome. Look at this box that had been sent to me by Lord Stefano of Palestrino. Open it and let's see what it contains. When I opened the box, I cried to the duke, My lord, this is a statue in Greek marble and it is a miracle of beauty. I must say that I have never seen a boy's figure so excellently wrought, and in so fine a style among all the antiques I have inspected. If your excellency permits, I should like to restore it, head and arms and feet. I, I will add an eagle, in order that we may christen the lad Ganymede. It is certainly not my business to patch up statues, that being the trade of botchers, 
who do it in all conscience villainously ill, yet the art displayed by this great master of antiquity cries out to me to help him. The duke was highly delighted to find the statue so beautiful, and put me a multitude of questions, saying, Tell me, Benvenuto, minutely, in what consists the skill of this old master, which so excites your admiration? I then attempted, as well as I was able, to explain the beauty of workmanship, the, the consummate science, and the rare manner displayed by the fragment. I spoke long upon these topics, and with greater pleasure, because I saw that His Excellency was deeply interested. While I was thus pleasantly engaged in entertaining the Duke, a page happened to leave the wardrobe. At the same moment, Bandanello entered. When the Duke saw him, his countenance contorted, and he asked him dryly, What are you about here? Bandanello, without answering, cast a glance upon the box where the statue lay uncovered. Then, breaking into one of his malignant laughs and wagging his head, he turned to the Duke and said, my lord, this exactly illustrates the truth of what I have so often told your excellency. You must know that the ancients were wholly ignorant of anatomy, and therefore their works abound in mistakes. I kept silence, and paid no heed to what he was saying. Nay, indeed, I turned my back on him. But when the brute had brought his disagreeable babble to an end, the duke exclaimed, Oh, Benvenuto, this is exactly opposite of what you were just now demonstrating with so many excellent arguments. Come and speak a word in defense of the statue. In reply to this appeal, so kindly made me by the Duke, I spoke as follows. My Lord, your most illustrious excellency must please to know that Baccio Bandanello is made up of everything bad, and thus has he ever been. Therefore, when he looks at it, be the thing superlatively excellent, becomes in his ungracious eyes as bad as can be. I, who incline to the good only, discern the truth with purer sense. Consequently, what I told your excellency about this lovely statue is mere simple truth. Whereas what Bandanello said is but a portion of the evil out of which he is composed. The duke listened with much amusement, but Bandanello writhed and made the most ugly faces, <laughs> his face itself being by nature hideous beyond measure, which could be imagined by the mind of man. These words of mine made Bandanello burst with fury. He turned on me and cried, And you, what do you got to say against my work? I will tell you if you have the patience to hear me out. Go along then, he replied. The duke and his attendants prepared themselves to listen. I began and opened my oration thus. You must know that it pains me to point out the faults of your statue. I shall not, however, utter my own sentiments, but shall recapitulate what our most virtuous school of Florence says about it. Well then, this virtuous school says that if one were to shave the head of your Hercules, there would not be skull enough left to hold his brain. It says that it is impossible to distinguish whether his features are those of a man or of something between a lion and an ox. The face, too, is turned away from the action of the figure, and it is so badly set upon the neck, with such poverty of art and so ill a grace, that nothing worse was ever seen. I mean, his sprawling shoulders are like the two pommels of an ass's pack saddle. His breasts and all the muscles of the body are not portrayed from a man, but from a big sack of melons set up right against a wall. The loins seem to be modeled from a bag of lanky pumpkins. Nobody can tell how his two legs are attached to that vile trunk. It is impossible to say on which leg he stands or, or, or which he uses to exert his strength, nor does he seem to be resting upon both, as sculptors who know something about their art have occasionally set the figure. It is obvious that the body is leaning forward more than one-third of a cubit, which alone is the greatest and most insupportable fault committed by vulgar, commonplace pretenders. Concerning the arms? Well, they say that these are both stretched out without one touch of grace or one real spark of artistic talents, just as if you had never seen a naked model. Again, the right leg of Hercules and that of Cacus have got one mass of flesh between them, so that 
If they were to be separated, not only one of them, but both together would be left without a calf at the point where they're touching. They say, too, that Hercules has one of his feet underground, while the other seems to be resting on hot coals. Oh, the fellow could not stand quiet to hear the damning errors of his cacus in their turn enumerated. For one thing, I was telling the truth. For another, I was unmasking him to the Duke and all the people present, who showed by face and gesture first their surprise, and next their conviction that what I said was true. All at once he burst out, Oh, you slanderous tongue! Why don't you speak about my design? I retorted, A good draftsman can never produce bad works. Therefore, I am inclined to believe your drawing is no better than your statues. When he saw the amused expression on the Duke's face and the cutting gestures of the bystanders, he let his insolence get the better of him, and he turned to me with that most hideous face of his, screaming aloud, Oh, hold your tongue, you sodomite! At these words, the Duke frowned, and the others pursed their lips up and looked with knitted brows towards him. The horrible affront half maddened me with fury, but in a moment I recovered presence of mind enough to turn it off with a jest. <laughs> you madman, <laughs> you exceed the bounds of decency, yet would to God that I understood so noble an art as you allude to. They say that Jove used it with Ganymede in paradise, and here upon this earth it is practiced by some of the greatest emperors and kings. I, however, am but a poor, humble creature, who neither have the power nor the intelligence to perplex my wits with anything so admirable. <laughs> when I finished this speech, the Duke and his attendants could control themselves no longer, <laughs> but burst into such shouts of laughter that one never heard the like. You must know, gentle readers, that though I put on this appearance of pleasantry, my heart was bursting in my body to think that a fellow, the foulest villain who had ever breathed, should have dared in the presence of so great a prince to cast an insult of that atrocious nature in my teeth. But you must also know that he insulted the Duke, and not me. For had I not stood in that august presence, I should have felled him dead to earth. Having succeeded so well with the cast of the Medusa, I had great hope of bringing my Perseus through, for I, I had laid the wax on and felt confident that it would come out in bronze as perfectly as the Medusa. The waxen model produced so fine an effect that when the Duke saw it and was struck with its beauty, he came to visit me more frequently than usual, and on one occasion said, Benvenuto. This figure cannot succeed in bronze. The laws of art do not admit of it. These words of His Excellency stung me so sharply that I answered, My lord, I know how very little confidence you have in me, and I believe the reason of this is that your most illustrious Excellency lends too ready an ear to my calumniators, or else, indeed, you do not understand my art. He hardly let me close the sentence when he broke in. I profess myself a connoisseur, and I understand it very well indeed. I replied, yes, like a prince, not like an artist. For if your excellency understood my trade as well as you imagine, you would trust me on the proofs I have already given. Look you, my lord, I constructed that furnace anew, on principles quite different from those other founders, in addition to many technical improvements and ingenious devices— I supplied it with two issues for the metal, because this difficult and twisted figure could not otherwise have come out perfect. It is only owing to my intelligent insight into means and appliances that the statue turned out as it did. A triumph, judged impossible by all the practitioners of this art. I should like you furthermore to be aware, my lord, for certain, that the sole reason why I succeeded with all these great arduous works in France under his most admirable majesty, King Francis, was the high courage which that good monarch put into my heart by the liberal allowances he made me, and the multitude of workpeople he left at my disposal. I could have as many as I asked for, and employed at times above forty, 
all chosen by myself. These were the causes of my having there produced so many masterpieces in so short a space of time. Now then, my lord, put trust in me. Supply me with the aid I need. I am confident of being able to complete a work which will delight your soul. But if your excellency goes on disheartening me and does not advance me the assistance which is absolutely required, neither I nor any man alive upon this earth can hope to achieve the slightest thing of value." The duke shook his head and departed without further ceremony. Accordingly, I strengthened my heart, and with all the forces of my body and my purse, employing what little money still remained to me, I set to work. First, I provided myself with several loads of pine wood from the forests of Seristori, in the neighborhood of Montelupo. While these were on their way, I clothed my Perseus with the clay which I had prepared many months beforehand, in order that it might be duly seasoned. After making its clay tunic, for that is the term used in this art, and properly arming it and fencing it with iron girders, I began to draw the wax out by means of a slow fire. This melted and issued through numerous air vents I had made, for the more there are of these, the better the mold would fill. When I had finished drawing off the wax, I constructed a funnel-shaped furnace all around the model of my Perseus. It was built of bricks, so interlaced one above the other that numerous apertures were left for the fire to exhale at. Then I began to lay on wood by degrees and kept it burning two whole days and nights. At length, when all the wax was gone and the mold was well baked, I set to work at digging the pit in which to sink it. This I performed with scrupulous regard to all the rules of art. When I had finished that part of the work, I, I raised the mold by windlasses and stout ropes to a perpendicular position, suspending it with the greatest care one cubit above the level of the furnace, so that it hung exactly above the middle of the pit. I next lowered it gently down into the very bottom of the furnace, and had it firmly placed with every possible precaution for its safety. When this delicate operation was accomplished, I began to bank it up with earth that I had excavated, and as the earth grew higher, I introduced its proper air vents, which were little tubes of earthenware such as folk use for drains and such like purposes. At length, I felt sure that it was admirably fixed, and that the filling in of the pit and the placing of the air vents had been properly performed. I could also see that my work people understood my method, which differed very considerably from that of all other masters in the trade. Feeling confident, then, that I could rely upon them, I next turned to my furnace, which I had filled with numerous pigs of copper and other bronze stuff. The pieces were piled according to the laws of art, that is to say, so resting, one upon the other, that the flames could play freely through them, in order that the metal might melt and liquefy the sooner. At last, I called out heartily to set the furnace going. The logs of pine were heaped in, and what with the unctuous resin of the wood and the good draft I had given, my furnace worked so well that I was obliged to rush from side to side to keep it going. The labor was more than I could stand, and yet I forced myself to strain every nerve and muscle. To increase my anxieties, the workshop took fire, and we were afraid lest the roof should fall upon our heads. While from the garden such a storm of wind and rain kept blowing in that it perceptibly cooled the furnace. Battling thus with all these untoward circumstances for several hours, and exerting myself beyond even the measure of my powerful constitution, I could at last bear up no longer, and a sudden fever of the most utmost possible intensity attacked me. I felt absolutely obliged to go and fling myself upon my bed, sorely against my will, having to drag myself away from the spot, I turned to my assistants, about ten or more in all, what with master founders, hand workers, country fellows, and my own special journeyman, among whom was Bernardino Manalini of Mugello, my apprentice through several years. To him in particular I spoke. Look, my dear Bernardino, that you observe the rules which I have taught you. Do your best with all dispatch, for the metal will soon be fused. You cannot go wrong. 
These honest men will get the channels ready. You will easily be able to drive back the two plugs with this pair of iron crooks, and I am sure that my mold will fill miraculously. But I feel more ill than I ever did in all my life, and verily believe that it will kill me before a few hours are over. And thus, with despair at heart, I left them and betook myself to bed. No sooner had I got to bed than I ordered my serving mates to carry food and wine for all the men into the workshop. And at the same time, I cried, I shall not be alive tomorrow. They tried to encourage me, arguing that my illness would pass over since it came from excessive fatigue. In this way, I spent two hours battling with the fever, which steadily increased, and calling out continuously, I feel that I am dying. My housekeeper, who was named Mona Fiore, a very notable manager and no less warm-hearted, kept chiding me for my discouragement, but on the other hand she paid me every kind of attention which was possible. However, the sight of my physical pain and moral dejection so affected her that, in spite of that brave heart of hers, she could not refrain from shedding tears. And yet, so far as she was able, she took good care that I should not see them. While I was thus terribly afflicted, I beheld the figure of a man enter my chamber, twisted in his body into the form of a capital S. He raised a lamentable, doleful voice like one who announces their last hour to men condemned to die upon the scaffold, and spoke these words. O oh, Benvenuto, your statue is spoiled, and there is no hope whatever of saving it. No sooner had I heard the shriek of that wretch than I gave a howl which might have been heard from the sphere of flame. Jumping from my bed, I seized my clothes and began to dress. The maids and my lads and everyone who came around to help me got kicks or blows of the fist while I kept crying out in lamentation, Ah, traitors! Enviers! This is an act of treason! done by malice prepense, but I swear by God that I will sift it to the bottom, and before I die will leave such witness to the world of what I can do as shall make a score of mortals marvel. When I had got my clothes on, I strode with soul bent on mischief towards the workshop, and there I beheld the men, whom I had left erewhile in such high spirits, standing stupefied and downcast. I began at once and spoke, Up with you, attend to me. Since you have not been able or willing to obey the directions I gave you, obey me now that I am with you, to conduct my work in person. Let no one contradict me, for in cases like this we need the aid of hand and hearing, not of advice. And when I had uttered these words, a certain maestro, Alessandro Lasticati, broke silence and said, Look, you, Benvenuto, you are going to attempt an enterprise which the laws of art do not sanction, and which cannot succeed. I turned upon him with such fury, and so full of mischief, that he and all the rest of them exclaimed with one voice, Oh, on then, give orders, we will obey your least commands, so long as life is left in us. I believe they spoke thus feelingly, because they thought I must fall shortly dead upon the ground. I went immediately to inspect the furnace, and found that the metal was all curdled, an accident which we expressed by being caked. I told two of the hands to cross the road and fetch from the house of the butcher, Capretta, a load of oak wood, which had lain dry for above a year. This wood had been previously offered me by Madame Ginevra, wife of the said Capretta. So soon as the first armfuls arrived, I began to fill the grate beneath the furnace. Accordingly, when the logs took fire, oh, how the cake began to stir beneath that awful heat, to glow and sparkle in a blaze. At the same time, I kept stirring up the channels, and sent men up on the roof to stop the conflagration which had gathered force from the increased combustion in the furnace. Also, I caused boards, carpets, and other hangings to be set up against the garden in order to protect us from the violence of the rain. When I had thus provided against these several disasters, I roared out first to one man, and then to another, Bring this thing here! Take that thing there! 
At this crisis, when the whole gang saw the cake was on the point of melting, they did my bidding, each fellow working with the strength of three. I then ordered half a pig of pewter to be brought, which weighed about 60 pounds, and flung it into the middle of the cake inside the furnace. By this means, and by piling on wood and stirring now with pokers and, and now with iron rods, the curdled mass rapidly began to liquefy. Then, knowing that I had brought the dead to life again, against the firm opinion of those ignoramuses, I felt such vigor fill my veins that all those pains of fever, all those fears of death, were quite forgotten. All of a sudden, an explosion took place, attended by a tremendous flash of flame, as though a thunderbolt had formed and been discharged amongst us. Unwanted and appalling terror astonished everyone, me more than the rest. When the din was over and the dazzling light extinguished, we began to look each other in the face. Then I discovered that the cap of the furnace had blown up, and the bronze was bubbling over from its source beneath. So I had the mouths of my mold immediately opened, and at the same time drove in the two plugs which kept back the molten metal. But I noticed it did not flow as rapidly as usual, the reason probably being that the fierce heat of the, of the fire we kindled had consumed its base alloy. Accordingly, I sent for all my pewter platters, porridgers, dishes, to the number of some two hundred pieces, and had a portion of them cast one by one into the channels, into the rest of the furnace. This expedient succeeded, and everyone could now perceive that my bronze was in most perfect liquefaction, and my mold was filling. Whereupon they all, with heartiness and happy cheer, assisted and obeyed my bidding, while I, now here, now there, gave orders, helped with my own hands, and cried aloud, O oh God! Thou, that by thy immeasurable power didst rise from the dead, and in thy glory didst ascend to heaven. Even thus, in a moment, my mold was filled, and seeing my work finished, I fell upon my knees, and with all my heart gave thanks to God. After I had let my statue cool for two whole days, I began to uncover it by slow degrees. The first thing I found was that the head of Medusa had come out most admirably, thanks to the air vents. And as I had told the Duke, it is the nature of fire to ascend. Upon advancing farther, I discovered that the other head, that, namely, of Perseus, had succeeded no less admirably. And this astonished me far more, because it is at a considerably lower level than that of the Medusa. Now the mouths of the mold were placed above the head of Perseus and behind his shoulders, and I found that all the bronze my furnace contained had been exhausted in the head of this figure. It was a miracle to observe that not one fragment remained in the orifice of this channel, and that nothing was wanting to the statue. In my great astonishment, I seemed to see in this the hand of God arranging and controlling all. I went on uncovering the statue with success, and ascertained that everything had come out in perfect order until I reached the foot of the right leg on which the statue rests. There the heel itself was formed, and going farther I found the foot apparently complete. However, when I reached the end, it appeared that the toes and a little piece above them were unfinished, so that about half the foot was wanting. Although I knew that this would add a trifle to my labor, I was very well pleased because now I could prove to the Duke how well I understood my business. Now it pleased my glorious Lord and immortal God that at last I brought the whole work to completion, and on a certain Thursday morning I exposed it to the public gaze. Immediately, before the sun was fully in the heavens, there assembled such a multitude of people that no words could describe them. All with one voice contended which should praise it most. The duke was stationed at a window low upon the first floor of the palace, just above the entrance. There, half hidden, he heard everything the folk were saying about my statue. After listening through several hours, he rose so proud and happy in his heart that he turned to his attendant, Sforza, and exclaimed, Sforza, go and seek out Benvenuto. Tell him from me that he has delighted me far more than I expected. Say, too, that I shall reward him in a way which will astonish him. So bid him be of good courage. <laughs> OK, 
okay so i hope you didn't hate that too much um i just can't read benvenuto cellini without uh sort of taking on a character he's just he's just awesome i hope this wasn't too dreadful i had a lot of fun doing it probably way more than you had fun listening to it but there it is so send your complaints and insults to our Facebook page, The Sculptor's Funeral. You can leave your vitriol at the forum at thesculptorsfuneral.com. And you can also tell me not to quit my day job via email at thesculptorsfuneral at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.